into it. We have lots of different perspectives on what's going on in the world around us. And today I have am lucky enough to have a special guest. And I pronounced it right on the first try. Let's see if I got it again. So Anne Sterzinger, if I got it right still? Yep. Awesome. So Anne, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about, uh, but she is, among other things, an author and very smart cookie that I have known for a little while now. And I find it kind of interesting in my life how there's a whole bunch of people in my life that know me as the the hackerspace guy or the, the science and children guy or the you know teaching math the kids guy uh, but they don't tend to know like the one thing about me that I find interesting and valuable which is my music side and in the case of Anne here we've known each other online kind of as acquaintances going back a little while but I bear, like I, I knew that Anne was a, an author and had written all these books, but until I invited her to this show, I had no idea like how it kind of impressive those books were, and like how like I, I, I haven't read any of them yet, but just going through them, they look very well put together, very interesting plots and stuff like that. But we're going to talk about the books later. I do want to get into more things than the books, and so just starting off. So where are you currently located? Right at this moment. Let's start there. I am currently located on my back porch. And what part of the world is your back porch? My back, my, my back porch is in L.A., in, directly between Koreatown and what I call Little Bogota. Little Bogota. Interesting. Yeah. And so L.A. is, from like some people's perspective, is kind of like this idealized place where dreams are made true, right? You've got Hollywood not that far away. There's probably celebrities nearby, right? So th things are just going peachy over there, right? Yeah, yeah. I fled Chicago to come to L.A., and almost immediately, my dipshit roommate let my cat out. My cat got fleas, and the fleas were infected with typhus because the entire city is full of what I call trash castles. Homeless people build houses sometimes very elaborate, like they're bigger than my apartment, out of garbage. Mm -hmm. And then they defecate right outside their trash castles. And this attracts rats, and there's no sanitation. And so medieval diseases are coming back. Yeah, I was, so, I was reading somewhere uh, that there was like a, an instance of a plague that happened not that long ago. The, wait, there was an instance? Yeah. I just heard that it, it was imminent. Oh, yeah, I thought, like, it's been like over the past couple of years, like, there'll be like one case and then like another case, but it hasn't like Jeez. caught on yet. It's just like s sort of there somewhere, <laughs> but it's not like a thing that we don't know how to deal with. But it's interesting, though, that things like typhus can still spread in... Enough that just someone like yourself can contact them, so that's the, or get in kind of close proximity to it. So that's kind of interesting. So yeah, but, my, go ahead. I, I'm sorry, cutting out. Okay, but in any case, so there's the experience of encountering the, this disease. So what what else is living in LA like, and how? For example, I, I, I've seen your your post on what is a medium, where you talk a little bit about the Airbnb situation where rent is kind of going up and feeding into kind of like a loop 
pushing more people to rent out with Airbnb. So maybe kind of go r run through a little bit of how that works uh, for the people who have no idea that this is going on. Uh, yeah, I kind of fell into this underground through catching typhus. I caught typhus, I had a full body rash, I was diagnosed, I was given antibiotics. They didn't work because doctors don't really know how to treat typhus because people haven't died of typhus since concentration camps in World War II. So modern medicine kind of throws up its hands and goes, well, you'll live or you'll die. Unfortunately, I didn't even get medical care because my dipshit roommate and my crazy landlord just let me lie there and without eating or drinking or moving and fall into this weird coma where all I could do was keep listening to whatever YouTube was playing because I had left my computer on. Right. I listened to about I listened to about seventy two hours of Jordan Peterson talking <laughs> about Disney films. Which, which um, when you're in like that kind of delirious fever state, I'm sure does great things to you, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, I wrote a science fiction novel in my head, but I'm not sure if it's good enough to write down. But, you know, I was a little vexed that no one else would ever read it because I was convinced that I was going to die. Fortunately, after nine days of lying there in a coma without eating or drinking, except for the bottle of Gatorade that I crawled out to the kitchen at some point to get, mm -hmm. um, I happened to have a French friend who was coming to visit, and he found the house and found me lying there in a coma and was like, oh, my God, and figured out how to call an American ambulance, and I was taken to the hospital. Which, pause. And by that time, that, I was... So the ambulances in California, do you have to pay for those? I do not know, because the minute I got to the hospital, they put me on Medi-Cal, which is... Because I hadn't been in the state long enough to establish myself and get insurance, so what they do if you're uninsured in California, I mean, in Illinois, if you're uninsured, they just make the taxpayers pay for whoever comes into the emergency room directly. Okay. In, in California, they put you on Medi-Cal, which is a form of insurance. I'm sure the taxpayers pay for that, too, but um, it's better organized and the money is better used. I, I used to be against socialized medicine. But since moving to California, the contrast between Illinois and California has really kind of opened my eyes to the fact that the profit motive when you're dealing with, like the profit motive when you're dealing with shoes, awesome. The profit motive when you're dealing with life and death, not so awesome. Okay. So I'm, I'm a little bit of a capitalist, a little bit of a, I, I'm not, it's not really even socialism, it's just common sense, like a public utility. Right. Anyway, but... Unfortunately, there are still some medical professionals who are incompetent. So I got to the hospital, and these dipshits didn't take my temperature. They just noticed that I, I was trying to fill out the paperwork, and I, I, I think I said my employer was Bob Barker or David Letterman or something. Right. And, and so they decided that I was schizophrenic and <laughs> threw me into the psychiatric ward. Which I'm sure does great things to the other people in the psych ward when they're probably not just throwing feverish, probably infectious you with typhoid in, but if they're making this mistake with you, they're probably doing it with others too, right? Mm -hmm. So that, mm -hmm. so how how did that go? Being inside of the psych ward in a new state that you have, how long by that point have you been in California for? I had been in the, in California for about three months at that point. Okay. It took the typhus a while to develop. When the fleas first bit me, my leg ballooned up to like three times its normal size. So I went and got some antibiotics. And the, the swelling went down, but then the full body rash started. And that was miserable because I itched all over. I still have, like, baggy skin under my armpits from, like, how inflamed my skin was. Like, I have... Most of the scars went away, but I feel like one of those pox-scarred women in a Victorian novel. But so the, know, go ahead. They just, they just don't really know how to treat it. It's, it's kind of a coin flip. They just... I mean, they can try. Right. But if you're in a psych ward, they never, like, they'll send an actual physician to the psych ward about once a week. So if you're in a psych ward, you're going to get no care. Right. Because they're be probably just going to take any reports of you feeling feverish or whatever and, and chalk that up to you being crazy on some level. Right. 
Yeah. 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 So just to sum it up in one comic image, one of the craziest hallucinations, I mean, part of my mind knew that I had typhus, but another part of my mind was having extremely vivid hallucinations. Okay. And one of the cra- one of the craziest was that President Trump just got sick of his job. <laughs> he decided he wanted to go golfing. Right. And he decided he wanted people to like him. And he knew that people hated him for stealing away our first female president. Right. Even even though she wasn't a human female. She was at least female. So he appointed me president. And, and I'm sure this is adding wonderful credibility on the inside of the psych ward, too, right? Exactly. You know, like, he appointed me president because I happened to be the one having the hallucination, right? So... I think I'm president of the United States, and I, at first I was going to refuse the job, but then I remembered that I had typhus, and the president gets the best medical care in the world, right. and I thought my my only chance of not dying was to be become president of the United States, and they were going to airlift me out to some perfect hospital. And Which, when you, you know, think about it, like, I've sometimes thought about Trump as, like, I, I don't know 100% his finances, but I've heard rumors on the side that basically he owes whatever, whether it's the Russians or the banks or whoever he's he's being kept afloat from running into bankruptcy for the nth time but he owes a bunch of people money and his way of getting out of that was to run a political campaign on the moonshot of being elected president where he'd then be able to like bilk the American public for a whole bunch of money and get himself at least uh, away from the creditors enough right so that sort of thing, becoming president just so you could get into the U.S. president's health care plan, I mean, it sounds a little bit of a stretch, but, <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I mean, I'm one of those people who should be president because I would hate the job. You know, the old yeah. saying, those who want power shouldn't have it. Yeah, I, th- I think I, that I might have even power. been in a Plato's Republic, I think. I'm not 100% sure where, but one of the books. really embarrassed. I read that in Greek, and I should remember that that's where that whoa, came from. Whoa, 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 okay, I'm so I saw now. one of your books, it's like a, I mean, it wasn't your book, but it was like a French author's book that you've translated from French. Did I get that one right? Yes, I was the first person on earth to translate Octave Nirbo's lost masterpiece, In the Sky, into English. It's a beautiful, gorgeous book, and you should read it, but unfortunately... I had a tiff with my publisher, and it's out of print right now. Oh no! So I, I, I need to get my shit together and get it into print. If any, if anyone out there can get that book into print for me very quickly and competently, please contact me. I do have one person who actually was even on this show before who does technically own a publishing company of some kind. I don't know if they'd be able to help specifically, but I certainly might try to get you two in contact. But so, in the meanwhile, uh, before I get into that book, uh, so you speak French, you speak Greek, you speak good enough French to translate a French author's work, which, I mean, that's, that's got to be pretty high uh, skill. And then Greek, what other languages do you speak? Hold on. I took uh, Latin and Greek in college and because I have a double degree. I have two separate BAs. Oh, God, I'm going to see now. I'm so tired today. Sorry. No problem. I have two separate undergraduate degrees in classics and French. So I speak French fluently. I can read Latin and Greek with a dictionary. I took one semester of German and can understand a bunch of that. And I've worked in enough restaurants that I at least understand Spanish. And I studied Italian, but it's been a while, so I'm rusty. Yeah. And, oh, and, oh and, I'm trying to learn Mandarin right now. Oh, cool. So in other words, like, you've probably got enough of the language skill that you can probably write convincingly in, never mind, you know, French, Latin, and English, and Greek, but probably a bunch of the other ones for, in the case of a book, the thing that the character says that is key for that particular Part. You always have to like keep just that one step ahead of your reader's language skill, which is probably where you're at for a whole ton of those, or at least. That's pretty cool. And being able to draw on the classics in their original form, that is an amazing thing and definitely a valuable thing uh, for writers to have, for sure. So back to the psych ward. So how did you get out? And how did the, the inside of that kind of work? Well, it's a bit difficult to talk your way out of a psych ward when you know you have typhus, but you think you're president of the United States. 
So my first instinct was to try to escape in a laundry cart. Okay. That failed. That failed miserably. So I did what you have to do in a psych ward to survive. I befriended all the other crazies. <laughs> Which, by the way, this is kind of how I see a little bit of myself in your life, where the context where we encountered each other is we are a little bit on the, the side of the abnormal side. Look, we'll, we'll, we'll put it that way. I found a quote on one of your uh, books. It was from the, I think it might even be the, the French one. It's a, no, it's the Urban Bazaar. That's what it was. And it, this is a, it sounds like it's a collection of stor- short stories from other authors, uh, including you, but it was, quote, stories too weird, too dark, and just plain too bizarre to be published elsewhere, unquote. And so <laughs> that seems to, at least from my perspective, as someone who hasn't read your books yet, but to kind of capture the essence of where other people can kind of view you at uh, as, as kind of this a little bit on the outsider uh, side. So I, I can definitely understand <laughs> from uh, the perspective of the other crazies, uh, perhaps, what that, I don't know, I'm just seeing myself kind of in that role, so <laughs> continue. Yeah, you you befriend the other crazies, which is the only, I mean, psychiatric wards are horrible places. The staff are cruel. The rules are draconian. I mean, I know you have to control the schizos, but it's always unnecessarily cruel. There were there. I met guys in there who had been released from prison mm-hmm. and had their next punishment was they had to go to a, the psych ward for a while, right. and they all wished they could go back to prison because at least in prison you're allowed to go outside once a day and you can smoke a cigarette and you're not so tightly controlled. Like it sounds bizarre, but according to these guys prison is better than a psych ward. So for a lot of psychiatric patients, we have trouble trusting other people. Right. So the psych ward does nothing on purpose to rehabilitate you. What rehabilitates you is learning to trust other people. You have to, you have to band together with the other crazies to mm-hmm. learn to trust them. And they're the ones who tell you how to get out of this maze. And it's basically a game. It's a maze. It's a rat maze. You have to convince the staff that you're getting you're, better. Yeah, that you were crazy to start with, right? Yeah. And, you have and to convince the, what's that? At least my understanding is that you are you have to convince the staff that you acknowledge you were when you came in you were crazy and that you get better. If I got right. Right. You you have to rub their egos and say, oh, yeah, you're really helping me. I feel so much better. I'm really doing better. It actually helped that a medical doctor finally came in and told them they were idiots for not taking my temperature. Right. But st- even after he left, the nurse lied to the rest of the staff about what he had said. Because wow. the longer they keep you there, the more they can melt Medi-Cal or whatever insurance you have. Right. It's in their interest to keep you there as long as possible because so, they're so, milking your insurance. So this is kind of an example of where you said earlier, like you kind of had your eye opened about how it's not necessarily a good thing to have a profit motive when human health is involved. Because you can say that, right? And on its own, it sounds like kind of like a valid thing to say. But until you have examples like that, Right, it's hard to, to get it across to people that yes, it is an important thing to not have when you're in a situation like that that little incentive there to to lie or to to cheat the system just to keep the one source of income still there. Because I'm sure like the staff there also have money problems. Like everyone's got money problems uh, going around, but it shouldn't be falling on you <laughs> to kind of serve as this uh, source of income for this system, of course, right? Yeah, I mean, like I said, capitalism works great for goods that people buy voluntarily. Right. Because the, the old saying is, I have a dollar and you have a pen, and I want the dollar and you want the pen, so we switch. Right. But when you walk into a hospital, you're dying. You don't have a choice. It's not. It's not a voluntary transaction. I think the difference is, whether it's a voluntary transaction or not. And and certainly, what is a voluntary transaction? There is a little bit of a gray area when it comes to things like health 
And kind of two examples on that side. I saw somebody's Facebook post this maybe past two weeks or so, and it was relating to sexual consent. But I think that the same kind of issues apply here, which is they basically said that if you're in fear and you consent because you're in fear for some reason, that that isn't actually real consent. I would agree with that, that if you are consenting because you're afraid of something bad happening, uh, for the most part, that's going to be not actual consent. But then they took it like a step further, which it was like, and if you're, I think it was like, begging was included in that. So if the person is begging for sex, that that is also, if you give in to that, basically, that that's not real consent. Uh, or if you're uh, made to feel, was it embarrassed or, uh, I don't think it was jealous. Anyway, yeah. one of those feelings. Yeah, anyway. well, well since, since I've actually been very clearly raped in right. the last year, I think there need to be there needs to be two different words okay. for rape and things that are sort of rapey. Right. You know? and, and rapey is like, actually probably a good step uh, towards a word like that. Yeah. So, but continue. Yeah, because being violently raped is not the same thing as being socially pressured into being raped. It's really not. Okay. It's not even in the same. It's in the same area, but it, it's. Emotionally, it's completely different. And I mean, I was 85% sure that he was going to kill me afterwards. So imagine being raped and begging him not to rape you so hard and wondering how it will feel when he snaps your neck. Right. Like that, um, that's, that's, that's a level of that's, terror that, that's and That's a fear. lot different from... A, a girl going, well, Aziz Azari was really insistent about having sex, so I gave it to him. Yeah. Totally different world. And, and I guess on back, back on to the healthcare side, right? Like there is also kind of that different world where there is going to be situations where you are literally dying, right? Where like you, you, yeah. you get to the hospital, you have typhoid, but that can kill you. There are going to be other things that can kill you and are probably going to kill you at a greater percentage point. And if you land on that hospital, you really don't have that choice. And even if you sign your name on the, the piece of paper saying you release them from whatever liability or whatever they make you sign, you're going to sign that piece of paper. It doesn't matter what that piece of paper says. Uh -huh. And so there's that level of kind of forced consent. And then there's going to be a whole spectrum of things up until that point. And so, but even so... The closer you get to that point, right, the, the closer you get to this kind of compulsion, the, the, the sooner that that capitalist view of things kind of breaks down and allows for the, the situations like, for example, your, your experience in the, the, the psych war to happen where you get trapped, right? If I'm you understanding know I, that. You know what I just realized? Go ahead. Socialized medicine is actually a libertarian thing because... The whole philosophy of libertarianism is not to coerce people, not to do harm to people. Right. So socialized medicine is libertarian. I like it. <laughs> I like where we're going. Here. So I. Yeah. But in the meanwhile, I do notice where the time is kind of clicking by a little bit on this. So on the topic of your books. So I, uh, you've written. I, I'm seeing like eight or nine books here so far i can't remember like more than a couple right and is it all published on amazon or have you been like finding publishers here or there how is that kind of working out i worked with the publisher for years who never promoted my work um he was a very nice guy we were old friends i'm sad that we had a falling out but i've been harboring a lot of resentment for a long time and when i had typhus and was feverish I wrote something on a public forum that hurt his feelings, so uh, he yanked my books out of publication. And is that um, one of the ones where you mentioned the, the French author one? Was that one of those, or...? Yeah, that was one of them, and Nusquam was one of them. I'm, and the text of Nusquam is so messed up. He did a lot of weird shit in InDesign, so... Um, and InDesign I, is I, a editing tool, or what is InDesign? Or, or do you let her mean... It's a, it's a book design tool but the thing was this is definitely partially my fault I asked for a lot of edits after he had it in InDesign mm -hmm. so my word file is very different from the polished finished book so it's I, I've basically got a saint of a person working on fixing the text for me right now so I will be self-publishing that as soon as possible it's probably 
this is embarrassing, but I've written a couple of books since then, but it's still probably my best book. Okay. A lot of people love it. I, this is the frustrating thing about And, and this is the, the nothing book, or the, what was it, Nusquam, if I'm pronouncing it right? Uh, Nusquam, which is Latin for nowhere. Great marketing move, and Give your book a name that no one can pronounce. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least it's, it's a, it'll be easy to Google once you find a way to, to type it. You're probably yeah. you're going to be the only person in human history that's going to write a book with that name, which is always kind of handy. Yeah. So a little bit of a step back, though. So what got you into writing? Like, why, why did you start writing? Why did you, why did you go down this path? Well, I was one of those freaks from some rural backwater who, I'm not Einstein, but I was smarter than the average bear there. I taught myself to read when I was like two or three years old. Mm-hmm. And, and I loved books. I absolutely loved them. But at that age, I was too young to understand that people wrote books. Mm-hmm. I just thought that they came down from the gods, you know, or like heaven or Valhalla or just they came from some wonderful place. And when I slowly realized that, like, the, the name on the cover was a person who wrote it, that's all I ever wanted to do. Right. It's to, be, so, to be one of those gods in Book Valhalla that produces these artifacts that then can drop like manna from the sky on to young people around the world, that sort of thing. Exactly. So I've, I've been doomed from the start. I really should have been a plumber or like something that makes money. My uncle's a carpenter and he's retired in style. Right. And so on that side, are you trying to entirely make a go of making a living with your books? Or is it something that you just keep trying to make a go of but keep getting dragged back to other industries or how does that dynamic work for you well uh, let's see I worked as a dishwasher for about seven or eight years when I was young because I was so socially retarded I couldn't even ask for a different job mm-hmm. then I worked my way up to well then I'm, I moved to Chicago oh shit oh. hey my computer just died well, we are still alive, so, so far, so good. Still there? <laughs> yeah. Cool. I just picked the phone. What was I saying? I moved to Chicago and got a job as a waitress, and that was pretty lucrative, but a couple months later, I sent my zine, which I wrote on an Underwood typewriter, which was, I wrote this zine on an Underwood typewriter that was typo-free, and I sent it into the Chicago Reader, which is a weekly paper there, okay. as my resume, and they... They decided to give me their crazy proofreading test, and I passed, so they hired me, and I became a copy monkey and freelance writer there. Okay. And that's kind of where I put my teeth on learning. When I was teaching myself to write, I had kind of a decent sense of, no, I didn't. I wrote like a little shit. I wrote like a pretentious little shit. Okay. It wasn't until I worked at a newspaper that I really learned to write. Working in a newspaper, and my first... I actually translated that book twice. My first pass was terrible. My second one was great. Okay. I learned to write in in the meantime. Like, translating that French book... You you know how people who want to be artists go to the Louvre and copy paintings? Okay. This is the first I've heard of that, but I would definitely believe that, having seen the the, the various kinds of attempts of getting into the arts. I mean... it's futile, but when you're young and you think you can paint or write, you really can't learn to do it unless you copy every brush stroke of a master. Right. And I mean, so, on some level, you have to start somewhere, and there are definitely worse places that you can start. But What's up? Well, you have to start somewhere, right? Like, the, you don't go from being like a, a novice to a master one step. You There's definitely levels of practicing and levels of copying that kind of are involved in getting from A to B. But on the flip side, if everyone takes the same path, right, you, you have to branch off from that path at some point. And also what I'm finding interesting about your kind of story there is yeah. how newspapers as an industry are kind of hurting right now. And they're just bleeding jobs all over the place. I think this past week I heard like there's uh, two separate newspapers, one here in Saskatoon where like the, the newspaper folded up shop and then like was able to com- make a comeback. And so they're, they're printing another issue right now, but they're on that verge of existing or not existing, this kind of newspaper for seniors. 
But uh, so as newspapers kind of get closer and closer to dying or converting into BuzzFeed, will we lose these people who actually, by working at these newspapers, learn to write? Because I'm sure it's not just you, right? There are definitely other people who go, I've, I've seen, go through this process where they work in the newspaper industry for a while, they come out and they write their book. And it seems kind of like a higher quality writing and thought process that goes into it because of that. You're, Go ahead. Geez, you're really cutting out. Uh-oh. Well, uh, and so your your computer is dead. But I think we're still hearing you on your side fairly clear. So do you want to talk a little bit more about the, um, where were we when we sigued into this? You know what? Go ahead. To the, I can go up the street to a restaurant where I can plug in my computer. Ah, uh, sure. If you want to head that way, you can pause for a moment. I will. I call you back once once I get settled there. Okay. We will have an intermission Hello? and maybe a musical intermission here. I will okay. hear from you then. All right. Hold that thought. Okay. All right. So we have a musical intermission. I'm just going to quickly bring something up here. While uh, Anne is still working on getting internet access, I don't want to play anything too risque because I uh, don't want this one, this episode being banned on YouTube. I think I'm going to play most of this song. And so this this song is illegal to play in its entirety, but I think if I like just play three quarters of it, it's going to be okay. So let's listen to Descramble. <laughs> This fortune is the wind it takes to all The first is as it speaks I pointed to a vector of 2048 unsigned bytes Then I'm the inflicted disc sector and will be decrypted The second is key A vector of six unsigned bytes The decrypted title key The local variables T1 through T6 are unsigned integers Local variable M is a pointer to SEC plus 2048. And here's the body. Step 1, reaching 5, 0 of key. Absorbed with the byte 84 of SEC. And treat the result as an integer. Or it with the hexadecimal constant OX100. And store the result in T1. Step 2, retrieve by 1 of key, absorb with by 85 of SEC, and store the result in T2. Step 3, take bytes 2 through 5 of key, and absorb them with bytes 86 through 89 of SEC, store the result in T3. Step 4, take the low order 3 bits of T3, which can be computed by the end of T3 with the constant 7 and store the result in T4. Step 5, multiply T3 by 2, add 8, subtract T4, and store the result back in T3. Step 5 and a half, advance SEC by 128 bytes. CSS tab 2 and retrieve a byte which will call B1. Use T1 as an index of the table CSS tab 3 and retrieve another byte which will call B2. Compute B1s or B2 and store the result in T4. Step 10, shift T1 right by one bit and store the result in T2. Step 11, take the lower order bit of T1 which can be obtained by taking the end of T1 and the constant 1. Shift 
left by eight bits and we sold it with T4. We stole the result back in T1. Step 12. Use T4 as an index into the table CSS that file. And retrieve a file, store the result in T4. Step 13. Shift the contents of T3 right by three bits. Resolve with T3. Shift the result right by one bit. Sword with T3 shift the result right by 8 bits. Sword with T3 shift the result right by 5 bits. And extract the lower order byte by ending it with that successful constant OXFF. Sword the result in T6. Step 14. Shift the contents of T3 left by 8 bits. Sword with T6 and restore the result in T3. Pause. This song is not legal to play in Canada. This song has been censored. This song has to be modified. Otherwise, it's a whole complete work. It is against the Copyright Modernization Act.
Hmm, still no Anne. Just trying to get our guest back. She's trying to get an internet connection right now. Just going to see if we can get another song in here.
Yeah, you're coming through pretty okay so far. So the noise okay. isn't. Facebook's noise cancellation has clearly heard uh, sports bars before. <laughs> but but, I, uh, but everybody in the neighborhood knows that this is the only place that you can plug in your computer. So I had to sort of wait in line for an outlet. Oh, no problem, no problem. So before we left, uh, you were kind of talking about how I think it's at the Louvre. The artists will kind of go to the Louvre and paint the master's works. I think that's where you were kind yeah, of... Yeah, I've actually written an essay about this in French um, for the Cahiers Nouveau, which is the Nouveau Society's uh, yearly uh, publication. Okay. And I actually wrote an essay in French. Congratulations, bitch. But anyway... Um, so actually, pausing there. So writing essays generally, I went through high school, and the particular track of high school that I went through involved a lot of essay writing and especially like late high school there was tons and tons of essays that I wound up writing and then like other than maybe blog posts I've never written an essay in my life outside of that and maybe university English courses but so you're saying there's actually essays being written out there and people are reading them in theory uh, in Europe yeah oh in Europe States. Oh, okay. Now it all makes sense. Not in the United States or Canada. Yeah, I think we take after the U.S. on that side. I, I mean, in Europe, writers are still rock stars. Okay. I mean, writers are still what podcasters are here. Okay. So, Which so, is why I'm considering moving. <laughs> <laughs> Again, but, yeah. But you know what? It's going to be hard to tear myself away from L.A. if I do that because... As many problems as there are in this city, for example, it didn't rain for seven months, which meant that all the piss and shit on the sidewalk from the homeless people just built up and up and up and up until the sidewalk was basically just piss and shit. Okay. It finally, it finally rained the other day and you could walk. But L.A. is fucking fascinating. Like, if you look down, it looks like a hellhole. If right. you look up, it looks like heaven because... You know, there's this Spanish architecture and palm trees and mountains. And then you look down and there's like a rat dancing on a dead person. <laughs> That's my rule for enjoying L.A., just don't look down. Don't look down. You know, I've heard that advice before. I think that was one of Sean Kennedy's little bits of advice. When he wanted something to write about, and he felt that if he ever hit writer's block and living in L.A., he would just look down. And then, oh, now head's full of stuff again. <laughs> <laughs> just keep going. But uh, so, going back to the writing, though. So for someone who has never heard of you before and is just kind of like interested in maybe trying to pull one of your books out of the library or something like that and just giving you a, a, one of your books a spin, which book would you recommend for that? I would recommend starting with this one. Like I said, it's still my best book. I'm about to publish what I hope would be my best book so far, but I'm not so sure. It's, it's, a, it's a science fiction book. Book and science, science fiction is so hard to do well. Right. And is this the Electra one or is this. Oh. Yeah, it's the Electra one. I've okay. already published one volume of it, but you know, I tried for years to get publishers to publish it, but science fiction is this whole. Look, I'm a very antisocial person, which all actually good writers are, which makes the whole like writing scene extremely ironic because the people who get ahead are the social butterflies because of the internet and just, just the way that like becoming successful kind of requires right where like you need access to the people who own the gateways on some level or form uh, right right and i would rather stay in my house with my cats and read and write and i love to go for long walks outside right and i love to talk to like normal people 
But the last thing I want to do is spend my time talking to some pretentious fucking writer. <laughs> I have this rule against kissing other writers' asses. Right. Which I broke once to tell that Jim Go that his dick was huge, but that's not really kissing his ass about writing. Well, and if he's got the the requisite dick to give that kind of a compliment, right? Like, yeah. that shouldn't really count, right? It's just a statement of truth. Yeah. So on that side, for people who are just starting out the path of maybe becoming a writer and maybe they're at the bookshop or whatever thinking, hmm, maybe I could do this, what would be your advice to the people kind of just starting out? Don't. Don't. <laughs> okay. It's a life of sorrow. I mean, I enjoy writing a lot. That's why I do it. But if you, most people who could be writers have other creative impulses. Right. Creative people are creative, and what I really wanted to be when I was young was a rock and roll musician, mm -hmm. but I could never afford the equipment and the practice space and all the shit that you need to become a musician, so I became a writer instead because all you need is a rusty typewriter that you dragged out of the trash. And, and I will also point out here that the, the the social butterfly getting access to the, the gateways thing is also something that happens in the music world. And that if you are the anti-social type who just happens to be a musical genius, you will run into the same kinds of problems. It's pretty much exactly the same on that side from what I can tell. So. Sorry, can you repeat that last statement? It's just that as someone who went into the, the rock music world, even for a brief period, to try to make a go of things. Like, it's, you will, if you're the antisocial type, you will fall behind compared to the people who also do the practicing, also have the talent, but just so happen to be very social people. They will succeed yeah. where you won't. Yeah. I think one of the only people who ever managed to break that rule was Kurt Cobain. Could very well be, yeah. Or at least I mean, he's in that small category of people who, who did that, if he was one of those uh, uh, and, types. And, you know, people people hate Courtney Love, but she might be the reason he broke through. Interesting. Because she's definitely the social type. Okay. So she might have she might have done that legwork. Oh, my God. i got to marry a social butterfly. You, you just might have to. That might be how it works. Shit. All right. Find me a social butterfly. All right, I'll, I'll get right on that. <laughs> so uh, that all you uh, eligible bachelors who are social bu butterflies out there, uh, pay attention on this show. Yeah, there we go. So other than that, as we are kind of getting near the end of the show, do you have any last things you want to kind of bring up on, on your books or otherwise? Oh, we were, we were going to talk about your, your last question was things to piss me off extremely in my life right now. There we go. Okay, we can go into that first for sure. Yeah. Two words, Chanel Miller. Okay, and what is Sh Chanel Miller? Chanel Miller was, she used to be called Jane Doe. She was the woman who was supposedly raped by Brock Turner. Brock Turner, that, that name sounds familiar. Who is Brock Turner again? I, I don't know if you've heard about this case, but the Chanel Miller-Brock Turner debacle was... Chanel Miller was a slightly older than college-age woman who went to a college party... And uh, she was cute. She met a cute, very young college-age guy, too young to be drinking. I mm -hmm. mean, she should have been arrested for giving him alcohol. Right. The drinking and age is higher in the States, right? It's What is it, 21 over there? Yes, 21. Okay. What, what, what is it over there? I think it's 19 here and then 18 in Manitoba. I think that's how it works. Okay, that, that makes more sense, because then kids learn to drink sensibly earlier. Yeah, and like, you're not really a kid at 19. Like, at that point, yeah. it, yes, you're still young and stupid, but you're old enough to know when you're about to be alcohol poisoned, right? Right, and it teaches kids to drink, like, not compulsively. Because if, if you're 17 and alcohol is illegal for you, and you can get access to it, yeah. you're going to drink a whole bottle. Exactly. Because you never know when you're going to get... So it turns it turns kids into alcoholics. Right. But anyway, and, anyway, the Brock Turner Ch Chanel Miller debacle. They met at this party. They were kissing. They were making out. Other witnesses saw them kissing and making out. They left together. They were both super fucking sloshed. Okay. And they fell down behind a dumpster. And she was probably too drunk to give, give consent. Right. But he was too drunk to know that she was too drunk to give him sense. Right. 
So these two busybody Swedish guys come along and find him, like, dry-humping her. He didn't even have sex with her. Okay. He was dry-humping her. And he got charged with rape. Okay. And so is this, like, a super recent thing, or...? It's fairly recent, I think, a, a couple of years ago. So, he like, was, going I through the court system, that sort of thing? Yeah, yeah. He he's spent um, maybe a year or so in jail. The big news story was... He was this, like, athlete swimmer, and the press decided that he got off way too easy because he was a privileged white male with wealthy parents, and so he got away with raping this girl. But the funny thing is, the girl was a lot richer than he was, for okay. starter. She, she was a lot older than he was, and she was blacked out drunk and didn't know what had happened. So she woke up in the hospital and t- was told that she had been raped. Oh, okay. And she had a boyfriend. So she went with the story because she did not want to get in trouble with her boyfriend. So right. she was like, yeah, I was raped. I wasn't making out with some strange guy at a party. I was raped. So there was this whole kangaroo trial, and the, the American press just crucified Rock Turner. That poor kid will never find a job. Right. Um, and Chanel Miller was known as Jane Doe for a long time, but then she decided to come out and tell her story in this, like, horrible Oprah way. Okay. And so she's been making the rounds of talk shows. She's gotten this massive book deal. Her parents were already rich. She's going to become a multi-millionaire off of basically getting blacked out drunk and making out with a guy at a party and, and, and then pretending she was raped so her boyfriend wouldn't break up with her. Right. I was actually raped. I wound up having to flee the city. I mean, the guy broke into my house, put his hand over my mouth, said, I'm not going to kill you, I'm just going to fuck you and leave. Right. And then proceeded to violently fuck me and leave. I was 85. I I think I said this. I hate repeating myself. Yeah, you you mentioned that you were pretty sure that he wasn't going to live up to that last part of that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, the police wouldn't arrest him until the DNA was processed. And in Illinois, the state of Illinois only has one forensics lab. And pause, I, I just actually posted something this week about how there, there were, I think it was 700,000 rape kits that were submitted to police departments across the United States, and I think including in Illinois, where they just didn't process them. And they've been sitting on shelves for up to 20, 30 years because there's such a backlog, maybe because there's only one person who can process them. But then in addition to the 700,000 that they were talking about, they were saying that there's probably another like three or four million rape kits that are just in the similar situation, but they haven't got to that point yet. Holy shit. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm really glad that I kept pestering the detective then. I right. mean, I kept calling her and calling her and calling her. And finally, after 10 months, my rape kit got processed. During those 10 months, my rapist burglarized someone else's house and was held in custody and was released. And <laughs> was released on top of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because they still hadn't processed the rape kit, like... I was I was raped in August. I, he burglarized someone's house in May. Right. And he was briefly held in custody, slapped on the wrist, and let go. And this was not his first go around. He's burglarized before. I think this might be his first uh, aggravated sexual assault they're charging him with. But at, at the same time, you don't just go from being a normal, well-adjusted human being to committing a rape like that, right? Like there's there would have been stepping stones on the way to you, guaranteed. Yeah, there, yeah. You are I mean, not I his mean, only victim, almost guaranteed. I'm sure he killed puppies as a child. Yeah, that's exactly. And, and, I'm, and I'm pretty sure he had no father and his mother beat him and all that other shit. But, you know, everyone, well, most of my friends have shitty parents and we don't rape people. Exactly. So I had to flee my city. And so I'm starting to, to see there, there's compare and contrast going on here, right? Where you have the, the affluent <laughs> a person who is going to make bank on her story mm-hmm. that is just in so many dimensions and ways 
insignificant compared to your experience. Yeah. And yeah. here's you languishing in poverty, waiting for, for someone to notice your existing skill with writing and the existing works you created. Yeah. That on their own, yeah. even without all this bullshit, are yeah. worth you being known to the rest of the world for. I, is, isn't that amazing? Utterly amazing, yeah. Do you want one more irony? Go for it. I had an experience that was very similar to Chanel Miller. I got drunk. I was talking to a guy. I had a boyfriend. Right. Next thing I know, I'm waking up in my own house. Apparently, either I had sex with this guy in my house with my boyfriend there, or this guy raped me okay. in my house with my boyfriend there. I don't, I don't know which happened because I was blacked out drunk. But either but way, your was, boyfriend was there. And... My boyfriend was there, and my boyfriend claimed up and down, he swore up and down that I was raped. He said he heard a struggle. I mean, and yeah, the living room furniture was knocked around. But I did not remember what happened, so I did not press charges because I didn't want to ruin someone's life over something I didn't remember, and I wasn't sure it happened. Right. So exactly what happened to Chanel Miller almost happened to me, and I did the right thing. Interesting. And a couple years later, I get punished by being brutally raped and having to flee my city and then catching typhus and then having to escape from a mental hospital while I know I have typhus, but I also think I'm the president of the United States. Right. So, chew on that irony for a while, listeners. So, I guess, as mentioned, we are kind of getting late into the show. So, do you have any last comments or, uh, that you want the world to know? I do have books that are in print right now. One is called The, the Talkative Corpse, and it's about a guy who's so angry and desperate and feels so insignificant that he writes his diary and then laminates it and buries it in hopes that it will be the only thing that survives the nuclear blast and he'll be the only thing that the aliens know about. That's why I called it the talkative corpse. Because right. he would be the only corpse that would be talking. Oh, okay. um, my other book, the other book that I have in print is kind of unexpected for a novelist. It's called Disaster Fitness because I noticed that the only people I knew who were making money writing books were writing self-help books. So I started writing a satirical self-help book, and then I realized that I actually had good advice for people who want to learn to like exercise. All right, and and that's the one I did see that one on on Amazon, and it like you said, it, it seems actually surprisingly legitimate. So if it's started as a satirical project, it looks at least from the out outside like it may actually be worth reading as a a real uh, guide to getting your kind of ass off the couch and moving yeah if you want the thing is the one thing i can sell is that i've never been overweight and the reason is is that i use exercise as a drug to block out all the horrors right and i sort of back and you know starting out an exercise routine is always miserable. And I kind of back-engineered how I get through that and how I get through the good part and how I enjoy it. And so it's humorous. So if you want an entertaining, not preachy, understanding of your mental troubles guide to getting your ass off the couch. Which, which I, is going to be recommend. like probably the, the hard part, right? Like it's the, the exercise itself it seems like as someone who's been just starting going to the gym as of not that long ago, like the exercise isn't the hard part. The hard part is convincing yourself to get to the gym to stay that extra minute or stay that, you know, whatever, right? It's it's the mental side is the, the, the hard part, so. Yeah, yeah, well, my first piece of advice is don't go to the gym. If you have the space, make a gym in your home. Okay. Because then you don't have to deal with the psychological problems of driving or walking and packing your fucking duffel bag and all that shit. Like that, that it's, it's that done. Yeah. And then I also back engineered how you get through the first five minutes where your body is like, I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to give away the whole. Right. The whole you have you, you'll have to read the book to get the full story, and it sounds like it's worth the read. So go out and buy that book. In the meanwhile, I will probably cut out about here. 
So for those of you who are listening, definitely go out and buy Anne's books. And once you've done that, consider also supporting me on my subscriber star at subscriberstars.com slash jeff-cliff. And I will uh, hopefully leave some links where you can find Anne's books anywhere where this video is posted. Other than that, I will hear you all or see you all next week uh, as we hopefully have more people involved. And with that, uh, I will uh, end the show. So see you all next week.